say the verse that goes along with the message. And uh, so today's Brendan's turn. So he called me and said, what color are you wearing? I'm like, red. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. All right, so if you have your Bibles, please open them to Matthew 7, 24, and 27. God, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken, liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell. And great was it was its fall. Amen. 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 A little brighter? Oof. A little louder too, huh? Want to turn this off, Jay? Okay, so God's solid foundation, right? And like the word was saying, everyone who hears these words but doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. You know, I don't know if a lot of people that live out in the country, but the people that do know out there always got to support the sand and whatever's under there to level out their houses, make driveways, garages, all that stuff, because the sand falls away with the rain, right? So today we're going to talk about that. And uh, when you're in Christ and Christ lives in you, then Christ is your foundation, right? So no situation, no person, no force, no power can bring you down. There's a lot of stuff to try. There's people, there's you know job situations, financial situations, all that kind of stuff just gets in our life and some of us just like, you know? And I've said before that if you come into church and you're not applying this stuff to your life, then it, it has no power. It gives you no power. It enables you in no way. I don't sneeze a lot, but I don't know what's happening. Um, but when you apply them to your life, when you apply them to your um, situations, whether it be uh, financial, your job situation, school even, you know, God tells us that if we build them, our, our faith on the rock, that nothing can touch us. And when it does try, it won't shake us. No building can stand without a foundation. The foundation of a building is the lowest part of the building, six feet down. This has a six foot concrete foundation under this building. But back there, there's like a river running through there. I don't know why. I'm calling it the river of God. <laughs> but it's running through there, especially when it rains. It's like all the water goes in there, and I'm like, is this going to come up and fill up or not? And it does, and it keeps flowing. So I'm like, Phew. But they built it like that somehow. I don't know why, but they did. But there's six feet of concrete under this building, which is kind of crazy, right? The foundation was prepared, the base was laid, right? The building was placed on it, but the foundation had to be real strong in order to support this building in particular. These are solid beams of wood. And I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that if we had built it just on the dirt, it wouldn't be standing here. It would, it would crumble, it would fail, right? In building, there are two types of foundations, shallow ones, Sometimes there's three, four, th uh, four inch concrete. Sometimes there's six foot, right? And there's deep foundations. Under these two main categories of foundations, you find and still have different kinds of shallow foundations and different kinds of deep foundations. Um, so you have to, an options to choose from when you're, when you're building a building. But we are spiritual buildings, right? In the word of God, our lives are likened to a building. I think it's up there, go me, huh? Next one, next one, uh, no, go back, one. Um, in 1 Peter 2, 5, 
You have that? You got it? First Peter 2, 5. It tells us that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood who offer sacrifices acceptable to God. For example, a marriage can be built on the foundation of a person's looks. Not here, right? A, we're talking about other churches. <laughs> but it's a problem if the only reason you choose to marry a person is because of their looks. Hmm? Because Proverbs 31 says, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, meaning it goes, right? A person's beauty or looks is fleeting, like you get older, it changes, right? Or no? Well, not nowadays with shots. Um, but it doesn't last forever. It can change with time events or circumstances. For example, a person's beautiful face can be left with some horrible scars after a fatal accident. You can also marry someone who's very slim, but a few years, you know, like in my case, your Texas fluffy. Because <laughs> everything's bigger in Texas. You happen to be born here. That's what it is. So if the main reason, thankfully, Lynn didn't marry me for my looks, but, uh, you know, as I got older, I looked more refined, so now she's super happy. Um, <laughs> So if the main reason why you marry the person is because of their looks, once this begins to change, your interest and your commitment to the marriage is affected. And after some time, you won't see any reason at all to be married to that person. It may sound funny, but it's not. Many marriages today have crashed because they were built on this kind of faulty or wrong foundation. The church of God is likened to a building. This we see in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 19 to 22, that should be up there. We are told that the church of God is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the building. Every building that has a brick and mortar has a cornerstone. Sometimes put, people put time capsules in there, sometimes people put you know, whatever in there, let people know whenever they tear the building down, that's the cornerstone. There's a date on there, who built it, why, or whatever, right? Is that your phone? Do I need to go turn that off myself? <laughs> Ephesians 2, 19, verse 20, uh, 19 to 22. And it says this. Should be up here, right? Yes, good. All right. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are too being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And we talked about that last week, about allowing God to live in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. If you don't give him permission to and you continue to do whatever you want to do, then you're going to continue to get whatever you're going to get. It is what it is. There's no if, ands, or buts. The Bible says hot or cold. You've got to make a choice. When starting a church or ministry, there are also different kinds of foundations that you can choose to build your church on. Now, some churches or ministries are built on the foundation of miracles, right? You've got some people that are, we're healing the sick, we're doing this, blah, blah, blah. And it happens. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Their central focus, though, now it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to have miracles in your church. You're supposed to, right? Jesus himself said in Mark 16, 17, 18, that signs and wonders will accompany those who believe him. Not just the regular Joe out there, but those who believe in him and believe him, signs, wonders, and miracles will accompany those. So there's, there's distinction, right? All of these things are good and should be uh, manifested in every church and in the life of us, the believers, right? Because if you call yourself a Christian, we talked about this last week, you call yourself a Christian and you don't act like one, none of this is going to mass manifest in your life. You can wave a Bible around all day long and nothing's going to change. You can wear all the Christian t-shirts you want and nothing's going to change. It is what it is. It's, it's cutting... Plain and dry. And I hate to be, uh, well, I don't hate to be the one telling you this, but 
I hate to be the one that, that has to deliver this message sometimes because like right now everybody's like hey man I didn't write it Jesus did I'm not making this up um, all, like I said, like all these things are good and they should be manifest in every believer but, if the, but it's a problem if the main focus of your ministry or church ministry or, or uh, let's just say you want to go feed the homeless or something. You want to start uh, a women's ministry or men's ministry or you want to deal with the homeless guys or the homeless females or maybe you just want to go to H-E-B and pray for people. If you make miracles the focus of that foundation or your ministry or your church, the day no miracles happen or they stop happening, all that goes away. All the people that were following you because of the miracles go away. They lose interest and commitment to your church or ministry. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. In John 6, verse 26 through 27. The people were following Jesus in large numbers because he had performed a miracle of provision, right? He supernaturally multiplied five loaves and two fish to feed over 5,000 people. And because the people had eaten and were satisfied, they gladly followed Jesus. Hey man, follow that dude. He's got, he, he can do it, right? Not really, because they, were interested, they weren't interested in Jesus or his teachings, but because they had reasoned it out that if he followed this man in his ministry, they would always have food to eat at every service in his church or ministry. Jesus quickly identified such people amongst the crowds following him. That's harsh, right? Jesus knew their hearts. And yes, he fed them to bless them and did all that stuff. I get a lot of homeless people here. And we help out a lot of people. There's sometimes I, got, I turn some people away. And when I got a new person here or... Uh, uh, a new uh, employee that hasn't seen what, what actually goes on here. <coughs> They're like, well, they were homeless. They were doing like, yeah, but they've also been here for two years drawing from, we just had a situation where this guy was drawing from Miss Pat for a minute. I even told her, I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, I helped him get his meds. I got him a ride over there. Got him a bus ticket on the Greyhound to go to South Carolina to see his brother that he hadn't seen in years. And his brother, I haven't made contact with him yet, but he said he would take him in. And I'm like, how do you know he said that? Well, because he said, okay, so all week long, the gentleman was sitting out here, and all week long, Friday I'm leaving, Friday I'm leaving, I'm going to get on that bus, I'm going to take off, and I'm like, okay, no, I mean, you know, make it your thing, just pick up your mess, right? Okay, okay, Pastor, no problem. Friday came and went, and I left it there so you can see, but you see out that bench? Right under the bench, there's a bottle there and a bunch of paper and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody go pick it up. I'll take care of it. But the bottle is not lemonade. You know what I'm saying? Don't come here and do that kind of stuff and expect a blessing. I asked them nicely to clean up and I let him stay there so we could watch him on the cameras. He'd have a shelter, he'd have a cover, he'd be in the shade, he'd do all that stuff, just clean up. And I thought about it long and hard before I asked him to pack his stuff up and go. Am I doing the right thing? Am I being, uh, loving my neighbor, you know? I know he's gonna go tell all the other homeless guys that pastor man, and they're gonna tell him, yeah, Pastor Gonzo don't mess around. Don't go over there pooping on the lawn or going behind the thing and sitting on the, on, the, on the fans back there trying to take wires out because he'll pull a gun on you. It's true. We have a huge homeless community around here. And uh, for the most part, they know us as a loving and giving church. And then we got people that are new to the community, right, in this area because they travel and they come try us. And then find out real quick, we don't play games like that. And it's not a game, right? They're, they're, they're suffering, they're, they're struggling. 
but I just feel like don't poop where you eat kind of thing. You know what I mean? Don't come over here and thrash our place and walk away and invite all your friends at 3 o'clock in the morning be hanging out here and doing whatever and then leave a mess and leave while this is God's house, right? But it happened and it did and I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna lose sleep over it. Some people follow the ministry because of the stuff, because of the, <laughs> the miracle, because of the music, the preacher sings really good. Uh, I smell really good. And I'm good looking and still got no people following me. <laughs> Who told me the other day? Miss Pat. I walked in here and she goes, man, you smell good. I said, it's, I just got here, Miss Pat. I haven't started to work yet. She goes, oh, that's what it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> but anyway, Miss Pat's good. She's unfortunately going to be leaving us in December. She's retiring. Um, so... Oh, wait, is Miss Marie here? No, I'm not going to say nothing because Miss Marie will tell her. <laughs> I'll just wait. Vamos a hacer algo. No. <laughs> so it'll be good. Um, but anyway, so people are following Jesus, right? And as we read further down John 6 to see what eventually happened to these people, we see that when Jesus started doing some deep teachings, right? Like I said, we're going to go deeper, more convicting, if, if anything, right? But Jesus started doing some deep teachings, teachings, and they very quickly and easily left him. That's in John 6, 6, 6. Imagine that. Right? This goes to show that God wants to perform miracles amongst believers, but he doesn't want miracles to be the foundation of any church or their ministry. Because miracles don't have the ability to sustain anyone in the faith. Yes, they keep you committed for a season, but the moment there's no miracles, no faith, no food pantry, no, uh, you know, I don't know, gun range, whatever, um, the commitment begins to dwindle. And before you know it, you're no longer in the faith. You stop going to the church, you find another church, and that church has this for a minute, and then you don't like it, and then you go back to this one, and you're back and forth. And we're supposed to be planted. We're supposed to be planted at a church, staying there, and fulfilling God's will in our life. We're not supposed to be like, Vagabonds going back and forth, and this church likes this, and they have music over here, and on Wednesday nights they got this, and Thursdays they got that. It, it, what's that? You're just following the miracle, right? Hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings here. I know it's not us, I'm just talking about other churches. Um, but this morning, I want to present to us Jesus as the only solid, firm, and eternal foundation to build our lives, our family, and our church on. He's the foundation that's unshakable, unmovable, and unshifting. It's because of Jesus in the only foundation that possesses all of these uh, characteristics. And that's why Brother Paul, in 1 Corinthians 3.11, he, he tells us to build on no other foundation than Jesus Christ. Not on the pastor, not on the pastor's wife, or the choir, or the children's group, or the men's group, or the women's group. He didn't say build it on that. He didn't say build your faith on people. He didn't say everybody's going to treat you like I am because they're Christians. Well, not every Christian is just like Jesus Christ. I said it. Um, <laughs> you build your faith on people, and they're going to fail you every single time. Something's just, something is going to, oh man, I, I thought we were friends. They go away. That's why, I, okay, so I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care where we're on TV or whatever we're on. They're probably watching. I know they're watching. Oh, wait, never mind. I'm going to say that. Um, but there's, you know, I, I'm a likable person. People love me. No, I'm just saying. This is the thing. I try to be uh, amicable with everybody. Hey, bro, how you doing? Da, 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 this, that. Nah. I know now why my pastor was standoffish sometimes. Like, um, Johnny would sometimes be like, we'd be talking, hey, we're going to do this. And Johnny would be like, and he would go do something else. 
not to be in the crowd. And I'm like, hey man, the guys want to do it. Yeah, yeah, I gotta go with the family. And I, I, I understood that. He was gonna go be with his family, I get that. Um, but I didn't get it till we started preaching that uh, while it's fun and cool and uh, Christian-like, I guess, to be friends with everybody and love everybody for sure, I can't be everybody's friend. We can't, like, I, you know, because, like, Jesse, I know, is he watching? He's probably watching. So, Jesse Saragossa, <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> he likes to be my friend. <laughs> I'm just playing Roger's friend. Um, no, uh, Jesse's great, man. I can't. That dude. Um, he's feeling bad. We'll pray for him here in a little bit. But, I can't be everybody's friend like that. I'm close to Benny now because he's part of the ministry. Um, but I can't be everybody's buddy because eventually they're going to get mad at me for something and they're not, gonna, they're, they're not only going to stop being my friend, but they're going to leave the church. Yeah. And then if they do that and they weren't like firmly planted in, in Christ... Right? Hardcore Christians reading their Bible, praying, doing what they're supposed to do when their life changes. If they, if they get offended by me and they walk out the door and never come back, they're not going to go to another church. They're just going to walk away. They're just going to be like, done. That's how all Christians are and they haven't gave God a chance. They never did. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, we go out, with, go out to eat with people and do things like that, but that's not the foundation of this church. I am not the foundation of this church. I will never be. Christ is. There are three major things we're going to talk about today um, that happens to a person or a church that makes Jesus Christ their firm foundation. Right? And the first one is this. <coughs> Proverbs 10.25 We will be able to withstand spiritual heat, floods, rains, and winds. In Acts 27, verse 13 through 25, it says, While Paul and the other men were on a ship heading to Rome, a terrible storm struck, and their, uh, and their ship was affected badly in the storm. In fact, the storm was so bad, the verse says in verse 20, that when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm kept raging, all of the men gave up hope of being saved. So it wasn't just overnight, you know, and Jesus wasn't there to be like, hey, calm down. No. It says it was going for many days where they didn't see the sun. And they finally said, we're, we're just going to die out here. That's what's going to happen. The men on the ship had completely lost hope and given up. They, they'd gotten to that point where they believed that at any minute they would die, right? It was only Paul in the midst of that terrible storm that was confident that nothing would happen to him and he wouldn't die. He would survive the storm. Now I can imagine all the men in there screaming in their heads, I'm gonna die, there's nothing gonna happen, Jesus not here, what's gonna happen, Paul, you can't do nothing, you know what I mean? They're just all mad. But Paul was saying a completely different thing. He was saying, I shall live and not die. I shall live and declare the good works of the Lord in the land of the living. The winds were blowing, the ship was shaking, but he was uh, declaring to himself, I shall live and not die. So what gave Paul so much confidence? I mean, he was just Paul, just a man who followed Jesus. But he had made Jesus the rock and foundation of his life. No matter what happens, I'm going to serve God. No matter what comes my way, I lose a leg, I do whatever, I'm going to serve God. That's what has to happen. No matter what happens in your life, the baby dies, grandma dies, papa dies, mamo dies, everybody dies and you're still alive. No matter what happens, serve Christ. Amen. It has to happen, right? And so he was confident that because he's standing on a rock that never fails, the storm wouldn't overwhelm him and he would come out of that storm victorious. The second thing that happens to a person or a church that makes Jesus, life, uh, Jesus Christ their foundation is that the gates of hell can't prevail against us. 
Matthew 16, 18 says that. Jesus says that I will build my church on the, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're the church. Our hearts, each and every single one of you is the church. The gates of hell refer to everything the devil and his kingdom do, do to try and bring down our person, our family, our church, our ministries. And there's a lot of ways that Satan tries to attack and destroy a person, or family, church, and ministry. But I want to just really focus on two main tactics the devil has, and it's deception and satanic um, opposition. There's a story in the Bible in Nehemiah 4, uh, 1 through 11, and it talks about these guys, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, and it's a very good example of satanic uh, opposition and resistance. <coughs> People were building up the kingdom and they're like, ah, it ain't going to work. You guys are going to fail. Blah, blah, blah. They're just those, those, those haters, right? Everybody has haters in life. You should look at my Facebook. I got a lot of haters. <laughs> um, but when the devil sees you're building something, and I tell this to a lot of people, whenever they lock arms with us, I tell them, look, man, be ready because the enemy's going to come. He's going to try to steal you from here. And he's going to mess up your life. And things are going to happen as soon as you lock arms with us, right? So when the devil sees you building, whether it's your spiritual life or you're trying to build a business or your marriage or uh, your children, right? You're trying to build them up in the way of the Lord or your business, uh, sorry, your career. Or even those things that you're involved with that are in the work of God. Like say you go help a church feed the homeless or you, you do a food pantry or something like that. Anytime the devil sees that happening, he'll send one of these uh, Sam Ballas or Tobias around you to mock your efforts. And sometimes it'll be your own family. Why do you go to church? You don't even believe it. You haven't changed. Yeesh, everybody got quiet on that one, huh? <laughs> well, and, uh, <laughs> geez. Oh, man. It's, it's too quiet in here. I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. Okay, good. Good, good. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but uh, God gets uh, these people frustrated, right? And their counsel and their gender becomes, it's, it's, it's focused on God. But where are the workers? Where are the people? And it's easier to get us off track, right? Mockers and those who oppose us um, and contend against our destiny are confused when God comes on and says, I'm the rock. They're my kids. They're my heirs. And they are my sheep. We don't believe that. The mockers, the haters, family, friends, people at H-E-B, whatever, are going to tear at our system. They're going to tear at our hearts because we believe and we try. I mean, we're super hard trying to stay straight, stay sober, stay with God. Uh, flow right with the Holy Spirit and we got somebody just talking smack all day long dude and it gets it finally gets here and once it gets here then it gets here and when it's here bless you when it gets here you got to deal with it so you can either close your eyes and hope it goes away which it won't or you deal with it and you say get behind me Satan this ain't gonna happen today you have no place in my family my business my marriage my life because I built my house my church my ministry on Christ the rock right then get ready to see this the disgrace of every Sanballat and Tobiah that has been assigned to your life no matter how fierce how strong the satanic opposition against you is the gates of hell will never prevail I can tell you that, but if you don't believe it, they're going to prevail. They're going to get into your life. They're going to get into your marriage. They're going to get into everything about you because you don't believe it. You don't stand for it. You have to stand for it. Now, um, yeah, why not? We're all Americans, right? Yeah. Every single one of us here, right? Everybody got papers? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is the thing though a few years ago well not a few years quite some time remember 
everybody in America got together and hated on who? The Taliban, right? The people who did all that stuff. They said they did all that stuff. Um, it didn't matter whether you were yellow, brown, purple, rainbow, whatever color, black, white, everybody stood together as one nation under God. Red, white, and blue, right? When that was over and done with, other flags started coming on the scene. And without getting into all that, because I'm going to get all this other hater mail, we didn't have to tell each other we were Americans. We didn't have to tell each other, you're welcome to here. I love you. Bless you. But for some reason, between 9-11 and now, everybody has a flag. And everybody wants to make that your flag. I'm glad that my daughter's out of school already. I don't want to deal with the mess that's happening over there in the public schools. I don't care what you do with your life. You want to be, you know, what do you call it? Uh, don't say anything. <laughs> if, if you want to fly the Dixie flag or the rainbow flag or the Ukrainian flag or any flag, you can do all that all you want, but don't push it on me. Because your beliefs are your beliefs. I don't go tell you, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And be waving in your face like that. I don't do that. Jesus didn't do that. Right? I have to love everybody sincerely. And, and if I can, help them some way. How is that helping them if I'm pushing my stuff on them? I can't do that. I can't be out there on the corner. Boop, 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 boop. If you don't get saved, you're going to hell. Well, I can tell you that from here because you and I can both read it. But me pounding you over the head on the street corners. We went downtown yesterday, right? And downtown in the middle of San Antonio went, all these visitors were there. We had anim, uh, anime, con, whatever that thing is downtown. All these weirdos running around like this. San Japan. San Japan. Kind of cool because, I mean, if you're in that kind of stuff, I don't know. It was just weird because there were some big monsters that didn't need to be big. Um, but anyway, there's a group, and they're sitting there, and they're and this is why you're rebellious nature and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, we all kind of know that. We know we're sinning, right? Well, how is you yelling at me from across the way going to change my life to follow Christ? If you're just yelling at me, telling me what I already know, right? Before I got saved, I, there's always people out there. And the guy going down military drive with a wheel and a cross all down military. And I'm like, first of all, that's not even a big enough cross. So it ain't that heavy. You ain't suffering. Secondly, there's nobody spitting at you. There's nobody throwing rocks at you. There's nobody whipping you. There's nobody kicking dirt in your face. There's nobody taunting you. There's not demons poking you. And you're not all bloody. So that little walk is just for show. It's not for come on, join the, join the bandwagon and be saved. And all. That does nothing for anybody. It just makes you look like an idiot out there. Sorry to say that, but it does. You're not winning people to Christ. People are laughing at you. It's when you tell people, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hang out with you because you're in that boat, in that mode, in, your, in that group or whatever. It doesn't mean you're judging them. It just means you're not going to have that in your life. Because if you allow it in your life, then it's okay to wave whatever flag you want in your life, in your house, at the schools. But let us go preach the Bible or let us go read. Let us go read with the kids at school. Hey, let me read one verse a day with you. Oh, no, we can't have that church of state. All right, cool. I'm just saying you got to be real. If you're not real, everything that this word says about building your ministry, and, and get this, you don't have to be a preacher to have a ministry. You have a, a business, that's your ministry. You have a family, that's your ministry. You have kids, you know, that... that um, say you're a single mom or something, you got kids, that's your ministry. Kids, your school, your work, that's your ministry. 
You got to get through that before you can do anything else. No one has to touch about it. You have to do that. The worst thing that can happen to anyone is to attend church every single week. And this is the third and the thing I want to talk about in the last one about this. Man, this is a hard one. Um, things that happen to a person who make Jesus our foundation, right? When you make him your foundation, you trust him with everything. Not just, you know, this part of it and this part of it. But don't touch that. I'm still working on that. When you trust him with everything... None of your labor will be in vain. It's not going to... Everything you go through, all the work you go through, none of it's going to be in vain, meaning that it's, it's all going to matter. When we got here, there were some things that were wrong with the building, but there still is, you know. But I trust God for every dime that came in here and has still come in here. Friday... When were we here, Jesse? Saturday, Saturday or Friday? That lady gave me that envelope. Friday, no? Uh, they got, yeah, Friday. Yeah. Um, I checked the mail and I got this, this, this letter. I always talk about checks in the mail, right? Got a check in the mail. I won't say her name because, you know. But got this thing and I'm like, hmm. It was a substantial amount of money. Let's just say it, 700 20 bucks. I don't know who the lady was. I'm looking at it like, who's this lady, man? I was, I'm trying to talk to Judge because he's in my office. We're sitting there and I'm trying to get some stuff done. But uh, I'm like, who's this lady? So I stopped and I started trying to research it. Went on Facebook. Didn't look like her. Then I found uh, her dad. And I'm like, no, nah, it can't be. So I called her. Hey, your tithe check ended up over here at our church. She goes, uh, okay, and I'm like, sure. Uh, did you send it to the right church? He goes, yep. That's okay, right? And I'm like, sure is. And she starts saying, you know, it's it's things were happening or whatever. She wanted to make it go. She wanted it to go somewhere where she knew it would be for God's glory. And I and I said, wow, dude, you're not even gonna believe this, but I just uh, bought ten thousand dollars worth of chairs. Wow, really? Praise the Lord. I'm like, yeah, praise the Lord. And I told her about the stuff that's going on with the name change and the branding of the church and how it's going to be uh, for his glory. And she goes, oh, good. So she's speaking it. Out of the blue, this lady that we've dealt with, what, Rose, probably about three or four years, um, goes to another church, does all this stuff, uh, was a rose at the other church, and that church closed down, so she had to go to another one um, over on the west side of town, so it's a little bit further for her to come out here. Elderly lady decided that, I guess, I, I would assume, because who she is, she sat and she prayed about it, talked about it, thought about it, and decided to send her time here, which I thought was just amazing. Um, so I feel like we're doing something we're supposed to do. You know what I mean? Um, I don't, I don't uh, have plate sales and stuff like that. It's just... Um, that, that to me is making your own money and making your own thing happen. That's how I feel about that. Men's group, women's group, a little different scenario but the same purpose. I believe that if it's God ordained and you're supposed to be somewhere, you're supposed to do something, he's going to make it happen. Whether by the, the grip of your own hands, right? Or someone's just going to bless you with the funds to do whatever you got to do. So, a lot of times, things don't happen and we just don't do it. We don't get it. That's okay. It wasn't for me to do or get. But the worst thing that can happen to somebody is we come to church every week to give to the support, um, to give support the work of God, um, to be more active in one department or ministry or the other for God is that if we do that and don't recognize and accept everything that's happening, just the fun parts. Because there's fun parts in church, right? Obviously, I guess you can miss church here and not get reprimanded. <laughs> Sandra. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, 
But if we come to week, if we come every week and, and just kind of show up and be here and kind of that, but not walk out of here on fire to like try it, you know, because you should be wanting to roll out of here to try what God had gave you this morning. I think. Corinthians, uh, sorry, First Corinthians three, verse ten through fifteen. It talks about Christian service that will go unrewarded. A Christian service that is just uh, a labor in vain, really, that nothing's going to happen. Um, let's not let that be our portion. But this can happen when Jesus is not the foundation of everything you do for God. If you're doing it to uh, look good in front of somebody, or you come to church because you're hoping to hook up, it's a true fact. Um, that's not why you should be coming to church. Just saying. We have a singles group here, but it's not a hookup group. Okay. I don't think they've done anything yet either, huh? Singles? No? Okay. Y'all should. I know. And invite us. We'll be the chaperones. No. <laughs> um, a lot of people who pray, give, and fast, but the motive of being seen and commended by others is not the thing. That's not living for God. That's living for the people. Trust me. I mean, there's times when, I, and nobody, every time I go out and somebody goes, hey, don't you know you from somewhere? You been in jail? No. Mm. You ever shoot up behind that dumpster on Walgreens? No. I'll give them every other scenario other than, uh, do you go to church anywhere? I'm a pastor. I, I, why? You know? It's probably somewhere they don't know me from anyway. But they know he's telling me, why don't you just tell me the pastor? I'm like, I don't want to tell them that. I just don't. It's not, it's not my title. I'm a servant. I'm a servant of the Most High God. I just happen to have this moniker that says pastor. It doesn't make me anybody special. I can't, I can't park the waters because if I could, I'd go down to Bronick Lake and go, come on, get your fish. 25 bucks. You know? Or go sit down on the river walk just waiting for people to drop their stuff and I'm like, use the force. You know what I mean? But I can't do that. So why am I going to say, I'm a pastor of a church on the northeast side to do all this stuff, and, you know, be homeless. And why, why am I going to do that? For people to look at me? I mean, they still look at me crazy. But a lot of people do that for God, but they do it with the wrong motives, right? So they don't get any reward from God. And then they get all, oh, I did all this, I went to the church, I gave this, I helped with the stupid chairs, and nobody, what, what? I'm just using that example, and nobody does that here. Uh, the most they get is people saying things like, that sister can pray very well, you know? <laughs> oh, that brother's so good, he's always fasting. That woman is a real giver. Again, no, we have those here in our church. Um, but it's good to be praised and commended by people, but it's much better to have God's blessing and his favor on what we do because that is what opens doors for us and changes our life. Not people, not me. I can't change your life. There's no way. If I could, everybody being here would have a little thing right over their heads. Sometimes my word must come out too. It's true. No pastor out there is perfect. I'm definitely not. I love to see, I watch TV, not TV, but the YouTube, I, I got to stop watching YouTube ever since we got this little channel, I've been like, ooh, check out YouTube. And I've dealt with some of these guys, and, I, and I, I know them behind the scenes, you know, and I'm like, bro, dang, how you, I just got to shut it off before I start getting in the mode and be like, hey man, I saw your YouTube, you're lying, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, I, I try not to do <laughs> Um, because that would make me judgy, right? I don't tell people anything. I'll let you do I'll, Hey, if you're sinning, I'm going to let you sin, man. When you come and ask me, or you tell me, here, this is what I'm going through. This is what's happening. Man, I don't know what to do about this. That, to me, is like you're asking my advice. So I'm going to tell you the truth. Stop doing what you're doing. Right? I wouldn't do that if I were you could have done that. This is what happens, and you're going to end up like that. Don't do that. 
I'll tell you the truth. But it's not my job to go around judging you and telling you, hey, stop doing that. Stop talking to that guy. Stop talking to that girl. You, can't, you know what about it? It's not my job. Far from it. But I'm here to tell someone here today, 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 right, that even though people can condemn you and you still return back to your problem after all their nice commendations, they're going to do that. People are going to tell you the bad stuff and, you, and you, you're going to be like, and then you're going to walk away, but then you come back and be their friend again. That's like the dog who eats his own vomit. That's what the Bible says. You stop that. God's blessing and reward can give you divine promotion. And it can totally, totally turn your story around. There's tons of people in this church that their story now is quite different from when they first started here. When they first started here, it was a different, different uh, onda, I guess. You know what I mean? They were, they were looking weird, talking weird, acting weird. And, well, some of them still act weird, but they're, they're safe. I know they're safe. Um, no. Um, but sometimes you see a dramatic change in somebody over a course of a, a couple of years, three years, four years, or whatever. And I like to think, and I like to believe, that that's God working in their lives. Because you see things change. You see the way they talk, the way they act, the way they move, the way they think, the way they, they handle situations. Praise the Lord, man. God's, God's getting into them, you know? The blessing that comes to those who have Jesus Christ in their, in their um, foundation is so immensely deep that sometimes we can't grasp it here. But we feel it here, and we dismiss it like, nah, that didn't really happen, you know? I'm going to read something to you. I think I put it on there, Isaiah 65, 21 through 24. Yes, okay, good. So if you don't have your Bible, please write this one down. Think about it here. I want you to chew on it this week. Isaiah 65, verse 21 through 24. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will, be the, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands, and they will not labor in vain. Nor will they bear, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. That's a big one right there. I want you to listen to this. When you're in Christ and you're seeking the Lord, your kids are not going to fall by the wayside. They're not. But you've got to hang in there for them because once you do go by the wayside, they will too. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. That means your grandkids, your great-grandkids, your great-great-grandkids, everybody who comes after you is going to know that you serve the Lord. And if your family continues down that path, your family will be built on the rock, Right? Before they call, I will answer, he says. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Whatever you're building, whether it's spiritual life, your family, your marriage, your business, or your career, or you're just helping to build lives for God, you're going to enjoy the fruit of your labor. If you're working for the kingdom, if you're doing something for God, if you're, even if you're just passing out flyers one day, just say you, you made a little sticker that says Jesus loves you and Hand it out to every person you see. Without talking to them, without praying for them, you just handed it out and went about your business. That person at that point will have something that nobody else gave them. Because you can give them a sticker and say, hey man, let me pray with you, let me tell you this, and da, 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 the whole story. But the act of doing that just says, here you go, here's a sticker for you. Say it's a smiley face that says Jesus loves you on it. For some people, that's all they need. Some people just need someone to remind them that God still loves them. They don't need all the stuff. They just need a simple reminder that no matter who you are, where you've been, what you're doing, or where you're at, Jesus loves you. A lot of us haven't been laboring for years, right? We, we put in a lot of work. 
for God. We put a lot of work into our marriage. We put a lot of work into our family, our business, our education and career. But it seems like nothing's changing. We're like we're laboring in vain, right? Like nothing, like man, I'm trying, I'm doing, I'm da da da, and it's not working. The more you pray for your child, the more it appears like your child is drifting away and getting involved in kinds of things that are shameful or not Christ-like or just getting away. The more money you pour into your business, the more it looks like the business is going to fold up like at any minute. I looked at the bank account this weekend and I was like, okay, you got a plan. It is what it is. If not, I'm selling these trucks and trailers and we're moving on, you know? But God has plans for us. And while it looks crazy on the books, um, in the spirit, River City Outreach, Persevere Training um, is a flourishing business for the kingdom of God. It's doing everything it's supposed to do as a business for God. It could have been just my business and my thing that me and Sandra, who's not here today, would split down the middle and so that would be our business. But since day one, we agreed and believe that it's to build the kingdom. So that's what he's doing. I don't think God's going to let that go. I pray he doesn't. So we continue to keep going forward, right? If you're in this situation today, I have great news for you. The great news is that when Jesus is your foundation, you will surely experience divine restoration in all of your ministries. And again, I'm calling everything a ministry from your home to your house, your family, your business, your grades at school, whatever. Whatever you're involved in, whatever is your priority, that's your ministry. So either you give it to God and build it on a rock or it's going to fail. Right? Joel 2.25 I will restore, or the restoration of all the years of the canker worm and calcar are stolen from you. You will experience divine restoration in all of the years that have appeared like you have been laboring or serving God in vain. If human architects, right, can produce such a beautiful architectural design, you've been to the Pearl, we went over there yesterday, and I was looking around like, man, this is nice. It used to be just a brewery, but they really fix it up nice. If human architects can produce such beautiful architectural designs, imagine, just imagine what a beautiful life, family, ministry, or church that is built by God will look like. My vision for this church has and always been a place of refuge, uh, an outreach center, and a place where people can drive by and be like, ooh, we can, they can help us there. That's a place where we can go and feel secure. This is what this building was, this, this, this church ground. This is what this was um, 10, 12, 15 years ago, let's say. They had a $150,000 budget a year. We got a what, $5,000 budget? <laughs> but they had all this money and didn't invest in the foundation. They didn't invest in the church. Rather, they did things to make themselves feel good. <clears throat> Stuff that happens now. If you walk around our building, you'll see the foundation cracking. And I'm like, man. They had an opportunity to build here. They had an opportunity to expand and do things for the kingdom that would far surpass anything that I'm even trying to think of. Matter of fact, it would have made my job here a little bit easier. It would have made this church here's job a little bit easier had they prepared for the future. But they were so concerned about us four and no more. I don't really want to reach those people over there. I like our church. I don't really want to talk to those people down there either. I like our church. Well, we'll do this on this day, but that's just once a year. We'll do this this time, but that's just once a year too. We're trying to do something here every single day. We have a senior center that goes 100% over here. Uh, Miss Marie goes to two senior centers. 
She's so involved with the senior community. It's awesome. If you ever want to know anything about the seniors, ask Miss Marie. <laughs> Are you still doing the exercise, Miss Marie, back there? You all still doing the exercise thing? Yeah. So they, that room back there, um, I see Miss Marie walk out of there sweating bullets sometimes. <laughs> because, you know, they're working out. <laughs> She's lying. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to lie in church. <laughs> no, but they're working out in there. So, um, she asked me the other day, because we were moving, she said, are we going to still be able to work out? Um, is that what you call it? No. I said, yes, I, that, nothing changes. Miss Merce Marie's workout room back there, so if you want to come hang out and work out, 9 to 10 on Tuesdays and Thursdays? Tuesdays and Thursdays. Nine, 9 to 10? At 10 o'clock, and then you go over there at 11, right? Yeah. So for, an hour, for about an hour, from 10 to 11, you want to come work out. It's a sit and fit kind of thing. They got weights back there, yoga things. I don't do yoga, but you know, it's back there. Um, come and work out with Miss Marie and Miss Linda. Um, don't stop doing for the Lord what God called you to do. We're going to end here in a second. Praise the Lord. Um, but. Uh, don't stop doing what you're doing because you don't see any results. You know, sometimes, I mean, I get up here every Sunday and talk about Jesus, you know, tell you what the, the word says, tell you how it should be. And then we got issues that come up during the week and I got to deal with them. I'm like, didn't you hear me Sunday? Didn't you put into practice what we've been talking about? All the verses that you get up here, didn't you put them into practice? I can't do it for you. I, I can't fix your heart. I can pray for you, but if you don't change your heart, yourself, with God, then I'm laboring in vain. I'm not trying to do that. So I give you the word. You're supposed to receive it and put it into action. That's it. It's pretty simple. But it's also super hard, right? Sometimes we feel like it's not enough. Like I gotta, I gotta stay busy to do stuff. I don't think you gotta stay busy um, I don't think you got to stay busy to stay on the path. Because I think sometimes you get too busy and you forget what God said. You forget about where he pulled you from. And you get busy trying to do stuff with those people and hang out and do that. Da, and, and it's all in the name of Jesus. Well, it's really in the name of you. Right? I've been there. Where I wanted to go help people that were just like me. And I got busy uh, proclaiming the gospel to them. But I really wasn't acting on it. I really wasn't enabling uh, my ministry to be uh, flowing in the spirit. I was letting it flow through me, through my hands. And I found out real quick that I could do that for a minute, but it was going to cr crumble once it got tested press down, right? Because when the pressure comes, you're going to do two things. You're either going to fight or you're going to bounce. And what happens a lot of time in churches if, if I say something from here that offends you, or you call me, or just because we're thug church, we're going to go there. Um, or I delete your meme from the, from the uh, Forge Glory Fellowship thing. Nothing personal. Don't ever take that personal. But on the top it says, for his glory info page. So that's information that needs to get out to you. And if I got all these memes on there, which don't get me wrong, I post a lot of them. But I post them on Facebook. Or I post them on the, the men's page. And even then I don't. Or I actually send that person a meme. Jesse, who's watching, can attest to that. You know? I've got some stuff that I, I won't put on that page because you'd be like, oh, Pastor, put that on there. No, but I put it on my Facebook page. 
You know? And then the Lord hits me once in a while and, and it's something that's a little heavy. And I'll post it and it's all quiet. All day long it's quiet. Nobody says nothing. But so, so that tells me that someone got convicted or offended, right? And I'm just like, well, that's between you and Jesus. But church isn't a hookup spot. Church is not a place to come and play games. It's not a place to uh, come and hang out on Sunday. Because, I, yeah, I know, I know. Because even me, I don't want to be here at 9 o'clock in the morning. Did you say yeah? <laughs> I like your honesty. See? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I know that I don't want to do it. My flesh doesn't want to do it. But my spirit needs it. My spirit, which is what carries my flesh, can easily leave me by the side of the road. Easily. I could get up and be like, that ain't going to happen. And not show up and then y'all get here and Miss Rose is at the door and Lynn's crying well, he didn't want to come to church today what are we going to do I don't know I hope one of you gets up here and preaches Ben you'll probably jump up here you know <laughs> but I have to get up I have to get up every single day and do what I got to do I complain about it don't get me wrong I'm not perfect I'm a human I complain about it sometimes Getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to Target. Ugh. Um, I go in at 3. I know. Well, and I got to wait for him to finish unloading the truck to get, to, to get what I got to get. Joseph, by the way, unloads those 53 foot trailers, um, all the boxes. So when they're crushed, you know why. <laughs> Crush more, Joseph, so we can pick them up. Um, um, but, you know, it, it is what it is, you know, and. and um, I know that our flesh is weak, but when, we're, when, we're, when God, when Jesus is our cornerstone, it becomes stronger, and you keep building on it, and you build on it, and you build on it every single day. Do something for Christ. Don't be, you know, the, the loud, you know, mouthpiece, clanging, you know, what the Bible says is clanging cymbals, just blah, 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 all day with all this nonsense. That does nothing for nobody. I know guys, I can't, I can't, I mean, there's verses that I know, but I know guys who can preach, or, or not preach, but, uh, what do you call it? Quote, recite. yeah, recite, quote, pages of the Bible. And I'm like, that's all cool and dandy, bro, but, weren't you with that lady the other day? Didn't your wife tell you not to go do that, and you did it anyway? She told you not to buy it? another freaking bike because the kids needed cool school supplies yeah but it's only one okay that's your ministry didn't your dad tell you not to spend all your lunch money because that's all he had for the week and you used it anyway and bought hot takis and all that other junk <laughs> well I get free lunch anyway yeah, but you're not going to have any spending money. So now you're stuck. Unless you get a job, which nobody wants to do nowadays. I'm just trying to be as real as possible. My life's a shambles sometimes, right now. They don't tell you. She's right there. That's my wife. Miss Elena back there watched me grow up. Ask her, what was Pastor like when he was a kid? She'll tell you. He stole from his mom. He used to... <laughs> All kinds of crazy stuff. She'll tell you. She ain't got no problem. But I'll give her full authority to tell you anything you want. I have people in my life that can check and balance everything I've done in my life. Anything I say from up here is not a lie. Um, huh? Yeah, I'm thinking. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm thinking about. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Um, things happen. You know. We have to make the choice to, to fight or bounce. I think it's worth fighting for our families. I think it's worth fighting for our jobs. I think it's worth fighting for Christ always. Always. Because he is my cornerstone. And without him, 
I, I wouldn't be up here on Sundays because my flesh would take over. I'd be like, let's go sell at the flea market. You know? I want to do a lot of other stuff, but I'm not. I'm here. And I go to bed thinking about this. I wake up thinking about this. Throughout my day, I'm thinking about this. There's people I pray for every day, and there's people I pray for every once in a while, and there's people I pray for at 3 o'clock in the morning, and there's people I pray for at 2 o'clock in the morning, and then sometimes right about 5.15ish, because I guess that's when they're waking up. I don't know what the heck. I'm just like, and I wake up like, the other night I woke up like four times. I couldn't even, I, man, I was wiped out. And sometimes I would just like to go to sleep and get like all eight hours of sleep. Lynn can go to sleep at 9.30, and by the time I get to bed, she's snoring. Like, oh, no, she don't snore. She, she's a lady. But, but she exhales loudly. But she's out. As soon as she hits the bed, she... I'm like, dude. And I'm there trying to go to sleep, trying to go to sleep, trying to go to sleep, and I turn over, I'm trying to go to sleep, and oh, I got to get up. And I'm just like, man. Now, I don't know if it's just what I ate or if it's my spirit in battle all the time, you know? And some of the time, the battle isn't even mine. I'm just like, dude. And, and I feel like calling people up like, hey, are you over there right now? Are you doing this? What are you doing? Where are you at? You know? That's not my job, though. That's not my job. So I don't. But I want people to understand that if you're not building your life with Christ as your cornerstone, then everything you put your hands to is going to fail. Everything. It's going to look good for a minute. It's going to feel good for a little bit, but it's going to fail. It is what it is. You guys are in high school. Jocelyn's in college. Grade school, whatnot. I'm telling you right now, that if you put Christ first every morning before you get up out of bed, before you grab your backpacks, before you step into that school, and you claim Christ as your cornerstone, your day will go a lot easier. The stuff that you read, that you have to understand, that you have to learn, is going to go easier. Same thing goes for people with jobs. If you put Christ first and build on Him from the minute you get up, you start building because every day you're building. Because if you're not building, you're tearing down, right? So if you get up and the first thing you do is smoke a crack pipe, well, that's what you, that's what you got that day. You're already defeated. I used to reach over and grab a joint and be like, oh, okay, I'm hungry for breakfast now. <laughs> well, yeah, imagine that. But I say, because you'd be up all night, I don't know. But I'm saying, but now you get up and you grab your Bible, your phone Bible, and you got the verse of the day. My thing's about 4 o'clock in the morning. Thing, I hear it. And I, that's what messes me up. When I start waking up, I'm like, I wonder what it is. And I'm trying not to look at it, but I want to know what the word for the day is. So then I look at it. Oh, it's not the word of the day. It's Jesse and the meme. <laughs> no, just playing, do I? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but a lot of times it is the, it is the, the word of the day. Mine, mine goes off at like 4.15. And so I read it. And I, then I try to go back to sleep, and it's already working in my head. So by the time I get up, it's already transpiring, right? A lot of us go through grief every single day because we choose to, unfortunately. And we may not consciously make a choice to go through grief, but the choices we make let us go through that grief. Instead of building, we're tearing down. And we're tearing down everything that God has built over the years. I'm 55 years old. He's built a lot of stuff around me. He's built a lot, he's built a lot of stuff through me. But a lot of stuff, I tried building myself. And I tried doing myself. And it all crumbled. I get that now. I'm not trying to do that anymore. So, Sunday service, Wednesday service... Uh, things like that, I'm trying to build you up to be the spiritual leaders of your house. You guys, the youngsters, are going to have a house one day. 
the adults have their houses and their ministries that they're already in process with. Just because it looks one way now doesn't mean it can't be here later. You can start building right now, today. You can start building like right now and your ministry will flourish. Amen? All right, let's stand up and pray real quick. Okay, you all bow your head with me and nobody looking around. Father, take over the building of my life and this church so that your beauty and your glory can be seen in every aspect of our lives. Father, be the master builder of our church so that your beauty can radiate all over our church. I replace every faulty foundation in this church with the life of Christ. I want everybody to repeat this after me. I declare and decree that Jesus is the foundation of my life. Men, I want you to repeat after me. Women, just pray. Men, declare that your marriage, my marriage, men, my marriage, my children, my spiritual life, my walk with God, and my ministry shall not be abandoned. I declare on the authority of God's word that God will perfect and complete everything that concerns his kingdom. Amen? Look up here for a second. Men, we are the leaders of this church. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Young men, young men, older men, Jesse, Jesse, we are the leaders of this church. When you got a church that women are leading, this is not to be um, demeaning or anything. But the man's place in church was to lead it. God ordained us to be the priests of our homes, our businesses, and our church. When you got women leading the church, it's not a bad thing, but it's a sad thing that they had to step up for their men. It's a sad thing that women have to take the pulpit because there's not a man to be here. You get that? Men, we're men. We're supposed to be tough. We're supposed to be machos. Spiritually, we could be giants if you accept Jesus Christ and you make him the cornerstone of your foundation. America now is in a shambles because they're making us weak. They're feminizing everything, including the pulpits. And when men don't be the men who they're supposed to be, families and children will go by the wayside and the enemy will attack and devour them. Right? Nobody like that one? <laughs> 